those walls that we call sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead now. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim this is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear that took our breath away. Faith so weak that we could barely pray. But he heard every word, every whisper. Now those altars in the wilderness Tell the story of his faithfulness Never once did he fail And he never will This is our God, this is who he is He loves us This is our God, this is what he does He says cross, he beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus, who pulled me out of that pit, he did, he did, who paid for all of our sin, nobody but Jesus, who pulled me out of that pit, he did, he did, who paid for all of our sins, nobody but Jesus, who rescued me from that grave, Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise, nobody but Jesus, who rescued me from that grave, Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise, nobody but Him. Our God, this is who He is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. He bore the cross. He beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. He bore the cross. He beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. God, King Jesus. This is our God. Would you pray with me? Dear Father, indeed we are here to worship you who is risen from the grave and who's died for our sins and loves us so much each and every day. God, we're thankful for the way you've taken care of us, the way you've blessed us, and the way you've helped us in so many ways this week. And that's the reason we're here today, to worship you. In Jesus Christ I pray, amen. Indeed, what a joy it is to see you here today, and I'm so glad that you've made it out this morning to First Baptist Church, and I hope that you have a great experience with us today. Especially if you're a visitor, we hope you have a, a wonderful visit with us today, and all we ask of you is that maybe if you would reach in front of you, grab a visitor's card and fill that out and place it in the offering plate so we could just have a record of your visit with us today. We would appreciate that so much. We got an exciting month ahead of us at First Baptist Church. It's always good to be at church, but this next uh, month is a special time and just so many different things going on. 
next Sunday in the morning service, we'll have an opportunity to, to baptize several young people that has given their life to Christ. That's always a special time for them and their families. Along with that, our handbells will be playing, so I know that you want to be here for that next week. The following week, we'll have the opportunity to, to recognize our senior adults in our church. You play such an important role in who we are as a church, and uh, we want to honor you. So we would love for you to be here next week. Also, after the service, we'll be going to Lake Point to have a meal. Please sign up this week if you would like to be a part of that. And then the following Sunday, it's hard to believe, but school is coming to an end. And we'll be honoring our seniors that are graduating from high school. What a, what a special time that will be. And then the following week, uh, we'll be having our parent-child dedication, which is Mother's Day. So what a fun time to be a part of our church and just uh, hope that you will be a part of each of these events coming up. You also notice that the rose is on the communion table this week on uh, April the 11th. Uh, Jacob and Peyton Ketchum had a little boy, John Bennett, uh, born six pounds, six ounces, and 20 inches long. Uh, family is doing good, came home yesterday, and so I know you'll want to be uh, in prayer for them as they adjust to uh, being mom and dad at home with a, a little baby boy. So uh, I know if you see Patty and John and uh, uh, Jacob and uh, Peyton, you would want to congratulate them. But uh, um, what a special time for them. I'm so glad that you're here today and look forward to, to worshiping together. Um, before we start, before we go and uh, you, you want to uh, greet each other, I do want to say a special thanks to... Uh, uh, Christopher Riles. Christopher Riles does so much around here to help make a service go together. But yesterday, messing with some cows, a uh, little cow got upset with Christopher and kicked, and uh, uh, Christopher's taking one for a team. He's going to the doctor to get some x-rays tomorrow, so we had to do some things a little different. So uh, uh, I want you to know that I appreciate you, Christopher, and all you do, and we're a church because of people like you, and thank you for taking one for the team today. So uh, thank you. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> Let's stand and greet one another this morning. Such a great time to be in the house of the Lord today. Let's start our worship off by praising him, praising him. Let's stand and sing together. blessed Redeemer, sing, O oh, work, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory, strength and honor, gift in His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children. Great. 
guitar today, so this is this is exactly what this song says. The battle belongs, and it belongs to him already. is a battle you see my victory when all I see is a mountain you see a mountain move and as I walk through the shadow your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear now that I am safe with you. So when I fight, so when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. And if you are for me, who can be against me? Yeah, yeah. For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Shine in the shadow, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Yeah. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you and every fear I. God, we thank you because we know that you have already won the war. You have already fought the fight and won the battle. God, we thank you so much for your love. God, we thank you so much because of what you've done to save us. God, it did not stop on Friday, and it did not stop on Sunday, God. You rose, and you beat the grave, God, so that you could give us life and give us life everlasting. God, and we have so much hope and so much joy because of you.
God, I just pray that we will go throughout the week, throughout the world, throughout our community, God, and we will continue to spread your word because you are our God. You are King Jesus. We love you and we thank you. It's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Freedom's calling, chains are falling, hope is dawning, bright and true. Day is breaking, night is quaking, God is making all things new. Jesus said.
such a great song there, Jesus Saves. Our offertory hymn is Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Let's stand and sing all three verses and our ushers will come at the end. Because we know that we can lean on your everlasting arms. God, you are there for us. You love us. God, when we can't even walk ourselves, God, you pick us up and carry us. God, we thank you so much for this church. God, thank you for what it means to this community. God, and I just pray that you will take these tithes and offerings, that you will use them to further your kingdom, God, and to bring you glory and honor. It's in your precious holy name we pray. Amen. have your Bibles, please take them and turn with me to 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 7, 2 Timothy 
2, 1 through 7. I love verses like this that we're going to look at today. They just kind of give us a picture, and we can learn so much from that picture. As a child growing up, one of my favorite uh, books to read was the, uh, the book, Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. From the moment he wakes up with gum in his hair, things just didn't go Alexander's way. At breakfast, Alexander's brothers, Nick and Anthony, reach into the cereal box, and they pull out amazing prizes. While Alexander, he reaches into the cereal box, and he pulls out cereal. The situation doesn't get any better at school. In fact, it gets a lot worse, and he wishes he could move to Australia to run away from all his problems. Alexander encounters even more bad news when he visits the dentist and then goes shopping for sneakers with his mom and his brothers. And Alexander's father isn't happy at all with him when the boys visit his office, and he gets a little carried away with the brand-new copier machine. Alexander, indeed, had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. And I wonder this morning, how many of us have had days just like that, when nothing seems to go our way? Days we wish we could just go and start all over again. Days we wish we could just forget. The truth sometimes is that life seems to be filled with more of those days than not. Well, as Christians, when we have those kind of days or weeks or even longer periods of time in our lives, what are we to do to survive? Well, in our passage of Scripture this morning, Timothy is having some of those days. He's experiencing some tough days as a Christian, and he is facing opposition as he lives the Christian life. And he is experiencing persecution because he's doing the Lord's work. And I can only imagine that young Timothy felt like running away and maybe giving up. But Paul writes to him to encourage him to endure the hardships he's facing and to continue to be a faithful servant in the middle during those tough times. And in this passage, Paul draws three pictures or gives us three illustrations showing us how we can be faithful servants even during terrible, horrible, no good, very bad days. So let's look at it together together. Uh, in 2 Timothy 2, starting with verse 1. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Endure hardships with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive his share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. Well, the first picture we see here is a dedication of a good soldier, a good soldier. In Scripture, the soldier analogy is used in several different ways, but it is most commonly used to describe the Christian. Both in Philippians 2.25 and Philemon 1.2, Paul refers to other believers as fellow soldiers. And probably the most commonly quoted analogy comes from Ephesians 6, when Paul speaks of the spiritual armor. The armor of God, like the soldier's armor for battle. But here, in our passage this morning, Paul has a very specific reason for using the soldier as an example. First, Paul hits the center of it right off the bat in verse 3. Endure hardships with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Paul is writing and reminding Timothy that the Christian walk is not an easy walk. In the very basic sense, when people think of a soldier, they understand that there will be some type of suffering that's going to take place. A soldier's life is one of hardships. It may be the hardships of leaving one's family. It may be the hardship of basic training. It may be the hardship of battle. 
It may be the hardship of aftermath of the battle. Whatever it is, a soldier should understand that there are going to be hardships involved. But even beyond that, Paul wants us to see something else in verse 4. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Now certainly Paul, in mind, is probably thinking of the Roman soldier here. A Roman soldier, when he signed up, he would take a soldier's oath referred to as a sacramentum. The soldier would quote this, that they shall faithfully execute all the emperor's commands, that they shall never desert the service, and that they shall not seek to avoid death for the Roman Republic. You see, it was a total commitment to the will of the emperor or the general, and any activity was considered acceptable if it came at his command. Furthermore, if he were to break that oath, it would be death of punishment, even uh, a death. You see, the Roman soldier was committed to the command of the emperor, and nothing else was a higher priority. The point was that the soldier must be free from distraction. They were to serve with dedication and focus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. And Paul is reminding us that any soldier, any good soldier, doesn't go off and just do what he wants to do. Or he doesn't go off and do what others tell him to do. No, he is focused on the commands of the commanding officer. His aim, his number one priority, his goal, is to please the commanding officer. And as Christians, we need to have the focus of a good soldier. Our aim, our number one priority, our goal, should be pleasing our commanding officer. You see, we need to keep our eyes and our lives focused on the Lord. Hebrews 12, 2 reminds us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and now sits down at the right hand of the throne of God. A general sent for a soldier and gave him an urgent mission. Take this message to the front line as quick as you can. The soldier saluted the general and ran in double time to complete his mission. After about five kilometers, he came across an old man sitting exhausted by the road who yelled, Hey, soldier, these food packs need to get to the front and my weary bones are too tired. The helpful soldier loaded them up in his pack and resumed his journey at a fast walk. It wasn't long before he found a nurse aiding a wounded man. So, soldier, she called, I have medical supplies that are urgently required on the front lines. Can you take them? He again loaded up and continued at a slower pace. Many kilometers later, the weary soldier came across a truck with a flat tire. The driver called out, lend us a hand. These rifles and ammunition are needed immediately at the front. Again, the tired soldier added to his load and trudged on. Just when the front line came into view, the soldier fell to his knees and collapsed, unconscious to the ground. The burden was too great. A day later, the general came by and revived him. Soldier, why didn't you complete your mission? The soldier weakly replied, I couldn't. My load was too great. The general looked at all the supplies the soldier was carrying and said, I didn't ask you to carry all these things. Your mission was to get an important message to the front line. Everyone was to retreat immediately. As honorable as your attentions were, soldier, you failed your mission. Lives that could have been saved are now lost. And in the same way, I'm afraid, too many times we too can lose our attention, our focus on what's most important and get preoccupied or get caught up in other things that hinder us from accomplishing the great things that God has for each one of us to do. You see, the word Paul uses here for gets involved is in implico, which means to weave in. It carries the idea of being ensnared or hooked or caught in 
an obligation. You see, we need to keep our eyes focused because we too are at war. The Bible tells us to be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And the devil, he's the father of lies. And, he, and one of his greatest desires is to get us to lose our focus and to take our eyes off Jesus. You see, the devil works a lot like a, a mousetrap. A mousetrap is not very attracting or appealing to a mouse. Just a piece of wood and some metal. But you know how it works. If you take it and put a piece of cheese on it, mice will come from all over to check that thing out. But what the mouse doesn't know is the rest of the story, right? Because when a little mouse comes and takes that cheese, the trap is set and the mouse is caught. The devil, he'll take sin. He will make the worldly lifestyles and the ungodly behavior look so appealing and attractive. But it's just a trap because the rest of the story is heartache, is hurt, is broken relationships and regret. Paul reminds us that we need to keep our eyes focused to have a dedication of a good soldier. Maybe the hymn writer says it best. Onward Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Christ, the royal master, leads against the foe forward into battle. See his banner go. At the sign of triumph, Satan's host doth flee. On then Christian soldiers own the victory. Hell's foundations quiver at the shout of praise. Brothers, lift your voice loud, your anthems raise. Onward Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. A good soldier, dedicated soldier. Second, we see a picture of the discipline of an athlete. The athlete is also a common used analogy in scripture. Athletes remind us of endurance, right? Hebrews 12 reminds us to run with perseverance or endurance, the race marked out before us. Athletics remind us of effort. 1 Corinthians 9, Paul tells us to run in such a way that we win. But here, in this passage, the emphasis is discipline. It's discipline. Paul writes in verse 5, Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. In the Greek games, I read there was three conditions every athlete had to meet. First, you had to prove that you were a native-born Greek. Second, you had to take an oath before Zeus that you had trained for 10 months. And then you had to compete according to the rules of the game. Otherwise, the athlete, regardless of how good he was, was disqualified from competing. And we all understand that, don't we? If you break the rules, you will be disqualified from the game. Sprinters, you got to stay in your lanes. Only so many football players can be on the field at one time. Pitchers have to use a regulation-sized ball. Soccer players, you can't kick the other opposing players. If you don't follow the rules, you can't play the game. Reggie Bush played football for the University of Southern Cal in 2003 to 2005. Bush won all kinds of awards, including the Heisman Trophy that year. But allegations that he received improper benefits at the time was central to a controversy surrounding the, the football program that led to severe sanctions for the school, two-year postseason ban, the loss of scholarships, and vacating a lots of victories that championship season. The NCAA also went back and stripped Reggie Bush of his eligibility. The status of many of those awards he won are in question. And later, the, he voluntarily gave up his Heisman Trophy. Likewise, God has given his children some guidelines, some boundaries, some parameters to live by. And to be successful, we must be disciplined to live according to those instructions. Some of those parameters can be found all in Scripture. You shall have no other gods before me. 
You shall not make yourself an idol. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. And you shall not covet. In this world, the Christians were sometimes called to say no sometimes to the many things today. There is temptation on every side that tempts us to give in, to indulge ourselves, just to seize hold of life and enjoy it now. But a Christian sometimes needs to say, no, I won't do it. Those things lead to distraction, they lead to disruption, and they lead to disqualification. That is the discipline of an athlete. God has given each one of us guidelines not to be some kind of killjoy, not to hold us back or to keep us from having fun, but he sets up parameters because he loves us and he wants, us to, he wants to keep us from harm so that we can experience life and experience to it to the fullest. Several years ago, our family moved across town. And as we moved, we, can, we were concerned that our outside cat, Sammy, would maybe try to return back to our old home. The vet told us that when we moved, we need to put him in a crate and leave him in the house for two weeks. So after the two weeks were up, it was time to let Sammy outside. So Sammy and I went outside in our big backyard for the first time, and we had a little talk. I said, Sammy, this is a big backyard, lots of room to roam, uh, plenty of places to go, but do not go outside the fence. Stay within these boundaries. And for several days, Sammy did as just what he was supposed to do. I would let him out. He would go and explore in the backyard, and, and then he would come back to the door. Oh, but one day, I let him outside, and our worst nightmare came true. Sammy didn't come back. For several days, we looked and we waited for Sammy to come home. It was pitiful at our house for several days. And then one night, as we were eating our supper, we heard a thud at the back door, and there was this black hairball mashed up against our back door window. Of course, we ran to the door, let him in, and when we did, he just kind of fell in the house, and then he ran and hid under Sidney's bed. When we finally got him out from under the bed, we realized that while he was out exploring, he met a bigger cat in the neighborhood, and he had gotten beaten up. He stunk. He was dirty, and he was hurt pretty bad. All that because he went outside the boundaries we had set up for him. Because he went outside the fence, he experienced things he should have never had to experience. And in the same way, discipline and obedience matters in the Christian walk. God loves us, and he set up boundaries for our lives. And we must do our best to be disciplined, to obey, and stay in those boundaries just like a disciplined athlete. And then finally, Paul gives us the picture, the diligence of a hard-working farmer. A hard-working farmer. Paul tells Timothy in verse 6 that hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. The first emphasis here is the word hard-working. Being a Christian is not just floating around life with God working for you. Rather, it is you working for God, enjoying the privileges of being his faithful servant and being used by him to do his work every day. What an awesome opportunity. But the attitude of many Christians today is I've become a Christian in order for God to work for me, to bless me. And if it doesn't go the way I want it to do, I'll, I'll just quit. I don't want anything to do with Jesus if it gets too difficult. And that is the very thing Paul is warning us about. The word Paul uses here for hard working is the form of the Greek verb that means to labor to the point of exhaustion. Now, I claim not to know anything about farming, but growing up, my dad, we had a big garden in our backyard. And I do know 
that it was a lot of hard work. It was tiresome. It wasn't something we did once or twice a week, but it was something we did every day. There was always work to be done in that garden. And a true farmer's work is even harder. Hours are long, often sunrise to sunset. During planting and harvesting seasons, farmers don't have days off. Steve, Steph Larson of Nebraska Center for Rural Affairs once wrote in an article, being a farmer takes more commitment than most people realize. Farmers know that their chosen profession is not an occupation, but it's a lifestyle. And it's the same thing for the Christian walk. Being a Christian is not something we just do. It is a lifestyle. And there's always work to be done. Paul tells us in 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. And Jesus tells us if anyone comes after him, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. You see, God expects us to be about his work and all things at all times. But the emphasis here is not only on the hard work, but also the reward of the hard work. Paul says a hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. An old farmer who was about to die called his two sons to his bedside and said, My boys, my farm and the fields are yours in equal shares. I share with you a little ready money, but the bulk of my wealth is hidden somewhere in the ground. Not more than 18 inches from the surface, I regret that I've forgotten precisely where it lies. Well, when the old man was dead and buried, his two sons set to work up to dig every inch of that ground in order to find that buried treasure, and they failed to find it. But as they'd gone through all the trouble of turning up all that soil, they thought they might as well sow a crop, which they did, reaping a very good harvest. In autumn, as soon as they had an opportunity, they dug for that treasure again, but with no better results. As their fields were turned over more thoroughly than any others in the neighborhood, they reaped more better harvest than anyone else. Year after year, their search continued, but only when they had grown much older and wiser did they realize what the Father had meant. Real treasure comes as a result of hard work. I read about a church this week, it's kind of like ours, and they had a meeting and they got out a, a whiteboard and they uh, discussed what it would take for their church and their setting to make a difference in their difficult context. Here's what they wrote on that whiteboard. Really hard work for a really long time in a really hard place. Really hard work for a really long time in a really hard place. That doesn't sound a whole lot of fun or exciting, does it? But that's what it looks like and takes to follow Jesus. May we be a church, and we may be, and may we be people who are found faithful in doing the work, the hard work of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for the, the picture of a dedicated soldier. God, thank you for the picture of a disciplined athlete. And Father, thank you for the picture of the diligent farmer. God, I pray that you would help us be a church, be people who are dedicated, who are disciplined, and are diligent. In Jesus Christ I pray, amen. As we close our time together this morning, I think kind of to sum up what I tried to share with you today, uh, the hymn writer 413, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, kind of sums it up. And maybe as we close our time together, if you have a decision to be made, maybe you've asked Jesus into your heart and want to make that public, or maybe you want to join our church, I'll be down here to, to love to talk to you about that. But as most of us, as we stand and sing, may we just listen and Hear the words that we sing to God as a prayer, that everything in our lives we would turn 
and live about Jesus. Would you stand and sing? Thank you again for being here today, and Mike, thank you so much again for singing. What a wonderful, wonderful job. And I hope you have a great afternoon and a great week. I want you to know how much we care for you and love you and how much, uh, how important and special you are, each one of you are, to our church. And if there's anything, anything we can do, just know that we're a phone call away and we will help you out in any way we, we, we can. You just, just got to call let us know. And so I hope you have a good week, and I hope I'll see you around this week. Uh, Bill Haney, could you close us in prayer, please? Yeah.